they know what's true because it's in the holy book. And that, that even, I mean, the most extreme case is the geologist Kurt Wise, who has a PhD in geology from Harvard and said, if all the evidence in the universe pointed towards an old earth, I would be the first to admit it, but I would still be a young earth creationist because that is what Holy Scripture teaches me. You cannot argue with, 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 a, with, a, with a mind like that. What do you find the most compelling argument for the existence of God? <laughs> well, the reason I say that God, or the religion poisons everything, is it makes intelligent people say stupid things, and it makes good people do bad things. And the arguments are not very good. Some of the people making them are extremely intelligent, but they're rather stuck with the old script. And when they get any better than the old script, which is really pretty shabby and battered by now, the burning bush, if you will, they tend to borrow from work. They stand on the shoulders of other schools. So now, having fought for a long time against the idea of uh, the, the Big Bang and evolution and so, as the origins of life and the cosmos, they now decide to annex it. They become frightfully interested in it. And they say, actually, the Big Bang is so amazing that it must have been God after all <laughs> that did this. And after, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the wonderful fine tuning that produces life. Slightly solipsistic argument, as you can see. But let's say, um, I've discussed this with my comrades as well. That's one that we find impressive, because at least it, it takes some work. Mm. Um, it's borrowed plumes from them, but it's, it means some work on our part. And, We've, we have said, and we, don't, we think that the fine-tuning may be pretty amazing, but is it more amazing than the existence of uh, 10, 100,000 billion other planets mm. in the universe where there's no life at all? Some design, okay? We're, so we're getting some traction there. Yeah. No, but I it's mean, been they... worth that, That's an argument I've found, found worth taking part in. There are it's lots a... of scientists who, who say that they are religious. If you actually cross-question them and say, what do you in fact believe? Mm -hmm. Which religion are you? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin and rose from the dead? Almost certainly the answer is no. They are spiritual. So am I, so is Lawrence. Uh, we may not use the word spiritual, but we get a kind of uplifted feeling when we look up at the stars, when we contemplate the great distances of space, when we contemplate the complexity of life. Um, there are people who will say, oh, well, that's religion. Well, you're playing with words there, and it's very misleading if people take from that, okay, here's a scientist who's, who's religious. So they then assume that the scientist believes in something supernatural, when all he really believes in is uh, what Einstein believed in. The God of Spinoza, the yes. order in the universe. Um, so, uh, so really religious scientists are actually quite rare, and we know how rare they are, because surveys have been done of both the National Academy of Sciences in America and the Royal Society here. And in both cases, it's somewhat, somewhere under 10% uh, who actually do believe in, in, a, in a religion in the true sense of the word. And as uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson has said, we really need to worry about that 10%. Um, you know, what's going on in their, in their minds? Uh, but they still are only 10%. And so um, when journalists, as Lawrence says, say that, oh, well, in order to have balance, we must have this side and on, on the other side, sometimes the balance is, uh, is artificial. I forget who it was, it said, when uh, two opposite points of view are put with equal vigor, the truth doesn't lie halfway between. One of them is probably actually wrong. There is a difference of opinion about how long our species in general has been on the planet. It's a, it's a flash of a second in evolutionary time. Um, Richard Dawkins thinks it might be as long as 250,000 years. Look, you make it a quarter of a million. Francis Collins, the man who did the DNA decoding, the Human Genome Project, who is, by the way, another Christian scientist, or rather, scientist who is a Christian. Um, I won't make that mistake again. Um, <laughs> you know what Mark Twain said about the work of Mary Baker Eddy, the Christian science writer, founder of it, her books? Chloroform in print. He said. <laughs> um, this is a digression. It's a digression. 
Francis Coyne says at least 100,000 years. We can show we've been around for that long. It's quite a long time. I'll take, I'll take 100. Never mind. I don't need a quarter of a million for my point. Make it 100,000. 100,000 years, people have been, our species have been around on, on this spec. Born, usually dying, actually, a great number of them in childbirth wouldn't have got beyond being born. For the first 80 or so, 90 or so thousand years, nearly 100, not living more than 25 to 30 years at the most, then probably dying of their teeth, if they were lucky, or of the other needless mammalian things that show us that we bear the stamp as Darwin put it of our lowly origin, the appendix we don't need anymore, innumerable other shortcomings of our design. We're, we're designed to live on the savannah that we've escaped from. Um, uh, terrible d disease, suffering, misery, malnutrition, and fear. Where do the earthquakes come from? Why is there an eclipse? What are the shooting stars doing? And awful cults of sacrifice to try and ward off what are in fact natural events, and war, and rape, and the kidnap of other peoples, and the enslavement of them. All of this goes on, gradually, gradually inching up to the point where you can brew beer, the breakthrough in my view, um, <laughs> domesticate animals, separate one kind of corn from another, so very millimetrical progress, but r terrible struggle, sacrifice, pain, misery, and above all, fear and ignorance. And you have to believe this if you believe in monotheism. For the first 97, 98,000 of this, heaven watches with indifference. Oh, there they go again. <laughs> They've all, this, that whole civilization has just died out. Well, what are you going to do? They're raping each other again. They've, they've, they're poisoning. The, they think that the other tribe has poisoned the well, so they're going to kill all their children. All this, just watch all that. 3,000 years ago at the most, it's decided, no, we've got to intervene now. <laughs> you have to believe it. You have to believe it. And the revelation is, must, be, must be personal, must appear. So we'll pick the most backward the most barbaric, the most illiterate, the most superstitious, and the most savage people we can find in the most stony area of the, of the world. We won't appear to the Chinese, who can already read. <laughs> we won't appear in the Indus Valley, where they know a thing or two and they're already, you know, they're very far of us. No. We'll, we'll appear to this brutal, enslaved, hopeless, superstitious crowd and will force them to cut their way through every all of their neighbors with slaughter, genocide and racism and settle on the only part of the Middle East where there's no oil. <laughs> and all subsequent revelations occur in the same district. And without this we wouldn't know right from wrong. I think that the, the sort of Newtonian, I mean, New, Newton thought that he was, he was working out um, God's laws and he was de demonstrating the, the glory of God's mind when he worked out the laws of, the laws of mechanics and so on. Um, I've, I'm not so at ease with that as you seem to be because it does seem to me that if there is a supernatural, superhuman intelligence that worked it all out, in a way that undermines the entire scientific enterprise because we are, maybe, maybe an evolutionary biologist feels this more strongly, the whole enterprise of evolutionary biology is to explain how you get prodigious complexity and design from virtually nothing. I mean, we hand over to physicists when we, we can go beyond the virtually nothing to the absolutely nothing. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, but, but if, you, if you start from, if you, if you say start from quite an advanced level, bacteria, and, and, and work up to, uh, to mammals and, and, hu and humans, um, we have a working theory which we know is true, uh, which explains how you can go from great simplicity to prodigious complexity. Uh, and, and finally, to the sort of complexity which is capable of designing things, of creating things, of working out how to do things. Well, 
if you are suddenly going to insert a designing machine, a, a, a creator, an, an intelligence at the, at the root of the universe, you've just undermined your entire enterprise because your entire enterprise has been to explain how you get to uh, something complicated enough to do, the, to, do, to, to do design. The answer to the question which with, with which we confront ourselves tonight, or are confronted if you prefer, does God exist, is to me, yes. It does. It must do. It must do because it is so real to those who do believe in it. There are people of whom it may be said that for them, God does exist. I've become perfectly persuaded of this by now. There is no form of persuasion that would make me assent to this proposition. Some of us are born. We are born too. Uh, in answer to Blaise Pascal's own problem, the one that made him write his pensée and address them to those who are so made that they cannot believe. Now, those of us to whom almost everything that Dr. Troy just said would be the mere equivalent of white noise. I suppose it's my job this evening to explain ontologically how that is the case. Perhaps I'll do it by force of example. Recently, very recently, in fact, uh, as little uh, uh, ago in time as last year, the uh, Vatican announced that limbo the destination of the un unbaptized child soul no longer exists. There is no such place. Um, St. Augustine was in error, it appears, in sending so many children, at least the souls of so many unbaptized children, to this destination for so long. Among the um, comments that I heard about this, among the mildest, actually, was that of a woman raised in the Catholic faith whose child had died before baptism could take place, who had for many years believed that that's where her unbaptized child had gone. And she said, they can't tell me that place doesn't exist. It's been as real to me as anything possibly could be for so long. They've no right to tell me now that this no longer exists. Ontologically, limbo exists for those who believe in it just as God does. I'm not here to deny that. It's only a few decades now since the rival church, the Church of Rome, uh, the Church of England announced that really no one actually goes to hell. It could be that after you die, you're forbidden God's grace, but there's no real place of eternal, unending, infinite torture and torment with which those who claimed the grace of God and the redemption of Jesus made a living for so many years. And how do they make their living? By lying to children. Think of it, hundreds and hundreds of years of people proudly earning their keep by lying to children and terrifying them and saying that because they could do that, they were morally superior to us. Reason, common sense, decency, ordinary decency rebels against this kind of mind-forged manacle, however charmingly or humorously it's expressed. But hell exists in the minds of several people I've spoken to just today. On this campus, in the, in the intervals of, uh, of other conversations. Uh, the, for them, it's real, and I don't say that it's not. But what I want to show is that it can, if it does exist, nonetheless be abolished, like many other mind forged manacles and man made tyrannies that confront us. And in fact, that this belief in a supreme and unalterable tyranny is the oldest enemy of our species, the oldest enemy of our intellectual freedom and our moral autonomy and must be met and must be challenged and must be overthrown. I want to argue for nothing less than that. It's actually rather wonderful, isn't it, that uh, religious authorities who used to say they were infallible say, just take the last pope, just the last. I know I'm not talking with a Catholic apologist this evening, but nonetheless, the church, when people say the church, they know which one they mean. They mean the one in Rome, the one where when Stephen Hawking was invited and was asked at the conference on the church and science, is there anything he'd like to see in Rome while he was there? He said he'd like to see the records of the trial of Galileo. Um, don't please be invoking Mr. Hawking, by the way, as if he was a deist. Um, the last pope, just in the last decade of his tenure, apologized. He said, we were wrong about the Jewish question. We probably shouldn't have said for so long the Jews were responsible for the murder of Christ. We were probably wrong in forced conversion of the peoples of the, the Indies, as they were thought of, the, the, the Isthmus and the southern cone of our hemisphere. 
we were certainly wrong. We owe an apology to the Muslims for the atrocities of the Crusades. We owe an apology to the Eastern Orthodox uh, churches uh, for the incredible butchery to which they, our fellow Christians, were subjected by us, the Roman Catholic Church. And we probably owe an apology to the Protestants for saying and so many awful things about them and torturing and burning and killing them too. So having now said we were completely wrong and completely cruel and completely sadistic and completely violent and retarded human civilization for that many centuries in that many countries and continents, we're quit. And now we can go back to being infallible all over again. There are, the, there are people who on faith will accept being spoken to in that tone of voice and in that way. But I, ladies and gentlemen, am not one of them. And I don't think there's any form of persuasion that should allow you to be spoken to as if you were serfs or slaves either. There are many people who call themselves agnostic, and I want to clarify this. It's rather a confusing term. I put up here a scale of religiosity from one to seven, where one is, I know there is a God, and seven is, I know there is no God, and we've got a scale of intermediate agnostic positions in between. Four is exactly 50%. Number four agnostic believes that the probability of God existing and not existing is exactly equal. Number two is, I don't exactly know there's a God, but I have a very high probability. I believe in a very high probability of there being a God. I'm a de facto theist. I can't know for certain, but I strongly believe in God and live my life on the assumption that he's there. Uh, a number six, at the other end, is somebody who believes there's a very low probability of God existing, but still not quite zero. I'm a de facto atheist. I can't know for certain, but I think God is very improbable, and I live my life on the assumption that he isn't there. I'm a number six. I'm an agnostic, but with the same level of belief in God as I have belief in fairies or unicorns. <laughs> Bertrand Russell illustrated this with his parable of the celestial teapot. Uh, he pointed out that it is impossible to disprove the hypothesis that there is a China teapot in orbit around Earth, or around the Sun, between the orbits of Earth and Mars. We therefore all have to be agnostic about the teapot theory, but in practice we are all a teapotists. <laughs> I want to make it clear that the agnostic position does not, should not, be confused with an exact 50-50 probability position. There are people who quite wrongly and illogically say, you can neither prove nor disprove the existence of God, therefore there's an exactly 50% probability of God existing. It's like tossing a penny. That, of course, is completely illogical. Just because you cannot disprove something, and the, and the teapot example shows that, it doesn't mean the odds of it being there are 50%, and you can quickly see that with the example of the teapot. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. <laughs> Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A